You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health podcast. I have Janet Bennett. She's the founder of a, a system called I Just Want to Sleep. Uh, the website is IJustWantToSleep.com, and it appears to be a, a system that helps people sleep better by reducing snoring and uh, giving them a whole host of other benefits. So, Janet, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Yeah, how did you uh, figure out a way to help people with their sleep? What was, you know, Usually it probably means that you've had sleep issues or you've been around someone who's had. Like, what's your what's your background here? Okay. Well, I'm a speech pathologist. I have been in the business for more than 40 years, and I have specialized in the treatment of tongue thrust for the past 25 years. And, um, no, I don't have sleep problems, but and I didn't know okay. anything about sleep problems, actually. Um, but about 15 years ago, I was treating a 14-year-old football player um, for a tongue thrust. Now that's when you swallow and your tongue pushes the back of your teeth and maybe you end up with buck teeth or maybe you swallow with your tongue coming out between your teeth and you have an open bite. So there's several different things that can happen if you're not swallowing correctly. But anyway, so I was seeing him for that and um, it, I, I had him, uh, he was going to be coming for seven lessons and he was with me on his third lesson and his mother came into the room and she said, Janet, what are you doing to Adam? And I said, well, what do you mean? And she said, well, he has always been the loudest snorer in the world. The windows and the doors just rattle and now he's not making a sound. Uh -huh. And I, I looked at Adam and I said, tell me more because I knew nothing about snoring. Tell me more. And he said, well, it's true. I can concentrate better in school. I'm making better grades. And this is what really got me. He said, and I run faster. Hmm. So that, that totally got my attention. I ran home, didn't even have a computer in my office at the time. And I just knew when I got on the, on the internet that I was going to find that people, uh, treated, had their snoring treated with tongue exercises. Okay. I, I didn't, I had no idea. Uh, but that's not what I found. Uh, what I found was that they are lopping off their uvula or they're pulling their jaw forward or they're using a CPAP machine or uh, expensive yep. appliances, you know. And, and, and the more I read, the more I realized none of them were really working. So um, I got excited. I've been passionate ever since that day. And um, it's it's the way to go because it's it's a harmless way to – uh, uh, fix your snoring to stop it. And it's, it's just been a, a very blessed road to travel so far. Um, so does yeah. that answer that question? <laughs> yeah. Well, for people that don't know, why does the tongue contribute to snoring or sleep apnea or other sleep problems? I, I'm sorry. What, say that again. Well, I said for people that may not know, why does a weak tongue uh, contribute to sleep apnea or snoring or other sleeping problems? Well, okay. So what really happens is it's not, we call it, we talk about the snoring because it's something we can hear and we can identify. Okay. But actually what this comes down to is mouth breathing. And when you, when you breathe through your mouth and you know, you're sleeping, your mouth's open, you're going to make some noises as the wind goes back and forth. So that that's the snoring part. But 
the the thing is, my tongue exercises, whenever they're done correctly, they train the exercises train your tongue to live up on the roof of your mouth. And and when you have your tongue up on the roof of your mouth, you cannot breathe through your mouth. Try it. Put your tongue up there. You can't breathe through your mouth. You're forced to breathe through your nose. And so the, these really are the major uh, things that need to be fixed to stop snoring and to have a better, healthier life because it, it forces you to nasal breathe. When we breathe through our mouth, we get cold, dirty air into our body. And when we breathe through our nose, of course, the air is clean because of the hairs in our nose, and it's warmed. And the biggest part about this is when we breathe, uh, when we breathe through our nose, there's this gas that we create through uh, sinuses, parasinuses, and our nasal uh, uh, area, and it's called nitric oxide. It's not nitrous oxide; it's nitric oxide. And when it, and nitric oxide is what helps regulate uh, circulation and oxygenation and all of that stuff. I'm not a doctor, but it, 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 it's what our body needs every night to get rejuvenated and ready for the next day. Okay. And so if you aren't breathing through your nose, your body is not making nitric oxide. So half the world breathes through their mouth. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and they, they don't, people don't realize that they, uh, what's happening. They don't know about nitric oxide. They don't know about these other things, but the tongue exercises come into play because you want to train the tongue to live up on the top instead of on the bottom. So throughout the day, ideally people's tongue should be, you know, sitting on the top of their mouth, on the top of their yes. heart palate. Right. It should be up on the, the palate, tongue tip behind the teeth, tongue as flat as, you know, touching as much of the upper palate as possible without being uncomfortable, just like sandwiched in between, you know, the up and uh, top and bottom. That's where it should be. Um, okay. And when a person swallows, their tongue tip should be right behind their teeth. And they swallow by kicking off from their palate and not from their teeth. So, all right. So what happens to people? Do their tongues get weaker? I mean, from eating and talking, that doesn't exercise your tongue enough? Well, no, apparently it doesn't. And the thing is, people who have... Um, a picture an open mouth. A person can breathe through their mouth, but it's not hanging wide open, and the tongue isn't always hanging out. Okay, um, but the the tongue is allowed when it's on the bottom. It's allowed to get real fat and happy and lazy. And and whenever, right. um, yeah, it, it's not made to live up on the roof of the mouth. Just the act of putting your tongue up on the roof of the mouth and making sure it stays up there all day. I mean, you're doing it subconsciously because we're in the habit of it, but just doing that keeps your tongue toned and st and stronger than the tongue that just gets to lay down all day. And so when it comes time to change that, uh, that position of the tongue, you need to do some exercises to get it toned and stronger. And And the other big thing that we find is that a majority of the people have a tongue that is way too wide for their mouth. And so my program hmm. ma makes the tongue skinnier. I, okay. okay that's why, why would their tongue, uh, is it their palate is too small, their mouth is too small, or is it their tongue is too wide for some reason? Well, normally it's going to be that the tongue is too wide. The upper palate is skinnier than the bottom. Okay. And so yeah. that's why one big reason that we have to make the tongue skinnier because we want the tongue to live up on the top and we want it to be comfortable so it'll become a habit. However, you can see people with a tongue that's way wide and they have like scalloped edges, just little indentations all around, which means their tongue's running into their teeth inside. Or they might have these big fissures, fissures in their their tongue, you know, where you can tell it's the skin's lapping over because it's just too wide and it's it's tight whenever it goes in their mouth. And so I have this special process of making the tongue skinnier. And I know people are always wondering, well, how do you make the tongue skinnier? Um, well, um, <laughs> there, there is a, a, a surgical procedure and it's where they literally shave off the sides of your tongue to make it skinnier. Um, that's one procedure. And then there's another surgical procedure where they just kind of cut the 
tip part in half, cut out a wedge, and then close it up so you've got a skinnier tongue. So the great thing is I have a way of doing that so that there's no blood or anything like that. I have a la natural way to do that. And um, uh, every bit of this program is natural. It's harmless. And the goals here, again, the goals are just to breathe through your nose instead of your mouth, keep your tongue up on the roof of your mouth instead of on the bottom, and um, it should stop you from snoring. And uh, whenever I first met this uh, football player I was telling you about and went home and found out that nobody knew about tongue exercises for snoring, um, I decided that I, I just wanted to produce the, some kind of program right then, okay? That's the way I am. And so I decided that I wanted to uh, work with a lot of people at first to, to make sure because, you know, maybe I was wrong. Maybe I had missed something, and he was just one guy. So I set out to find a lot of people, and I found 86 people all over the United States who wanted to be my, quote, guinea pigs. And I wanted to use them to help me word the perfect program because I started thinking, wait a minute, everybody, well, a, a large per a percentage of the population needs to know about these tongue exercises. But I'm only one person and I felt a need to right, save yeah. the world, uh, you know, but but I, I couldn't do that. So I quickly thought I don't want to train the trainer. That does not interest me. And I can't do it by myself. So I immediately decided. I needed to produce a, a, a treatment program that the person, um, the, the person who's not educated about any of this stuff or, or are educated about it, that they could do it by themselves. They could actually look at pictures or look at videos and read about the exercises and know exactly how to do them. And it, it, I figured if they had step-by-step -step instructions on everything, they should be able to yeah. do it without me. So that's what I set out to do. And these 86 people, it took me um, six or seven months to treat all of these people. And and it was when we didn't have Skype back then. <laughs> um, so anyway, I, uh, every every morning, the first um, once a week, I would send them a, a new lesson. And that evening, I would talk to them on the phone and I'd make sure they understood how, you know, how I worded it. And if they didn't, they would help me reword it. I, it just made me feel better, you know, knowing that. 86 people I'd gotten their opinion on how to word things and and they understood yeah. it um yeah yeah so after all was said and done wait before I say that okay so I didn't know anything about snoring but it, it, since I had started looking on the internet now I started seeing some other health issues that seemed to be re related maybe to mouth breathing or whatever, I, I was still at the learning stage, okay? I, I didn't know myself. So I just saw all of these different health issues like um, like um, dry mouth, restless leg syndrome, high blood pressure, insomnia, heartburn, waking with sweating, all, all kinds of things like that. And right. so I, I had this um, checklist where the people, before they started my program, I got a baseline on what issues they had. And then I did the same thing after they did my program so I could compare if anything else changed. Okay. I, I had no, I had no, no idea that anything else would change. I was not anticipating anything else. So um, after treating all these people, 94% stopped snoring. Jeez, that's amazing. It was how amazing. long is the, uh, yeah, how long is the program and how much time did they spend every day? In, uh, Okay, that's great. That's a great question. It's seven weeks long, and each week I would teach them new exercises. And the exercises, um, each exercise by itself wouldn't take, well, it'd be five minutes or less, okay? Uh, not very long at all, but they had, to, they had to promise me that they would do them twice a day. So, um, you know, 10 minutes or less every day and I would always joke with them tell them now if you screw up and do it a little longer it won't hurt <laughs> so yeah. because none of these will harm you it will just make you better faster and um so I I found uh, when I was said and done these these other health issues um we saw great results with them but but I learned very quickly as people started reprimanding me that I couldn't say that that my program helped heartburn or helped any of those other things until I had um, uh, done it with a, a 
a double blind study and had it published in a journal. Okay. So, uh, well, this is, this is just what I was told. And so I had to, uh, I had to omit any medical words that I used. Um, but, but the thing is that these people just reported this to me. Now I was just the messenger and, and these, this is not something that I'm saying the I just want to sleep program did. It's just, things that the people experienced after my program and um right that's what, and I am, what uh, I, customers said right right, right. and i'm going to share a few of them if that's okay um of course, yeah. because of course. okay um well you know what you know what i say if, uh, if 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 everything needed to be a double blind study then no one should eat food or drink water because it hasn't been tested that food is uh, good for you so no one should eat okay. any food there's been no studies right. on it. Yeah. Good, good point. Good point. Well, the other thing is that we're kind of thinking about over here is, is it really ethical if I were to meet uh, some people um, who have uh, sleep apnea or snoring, maybe they do have sleep apnea or not. Uh, I can't say that my program helps that either, but um, can I ask them to sit over here in a blind study uh, and be the control group and for a couple of months, maybe? And, and, you know, they're just, their heart is at risk and those kinds of things. So anyway, that, that is interesting to note. But, okay, just very quickly here. Heartburn went yep. away 82%. Um, rest, restless leg syndrome, and I know the books say it's a neurological problem. Um, 92% of the people say it went away. Yep. Uh, ADD, 60%. Of course, you see, they're breathing through their nose. They're getting clean air and filtered air and and nitric oxide and so everything's oxygenated and you know um, their bodies are totally different of course you don't wake up with a dry mouth when you you breathe through your nose you don't wake up with that headache when you breathe through your nose um, uh, 88 percent stop grinding their teeth and um, I had a, an orthodontist from Connecticut called me early on and said Janet I want to tell you why your program works and I said okay <laughs> Tell me, I'm wondering myself. <laughs> and he said, "Well, when you put your tongue up on the spot on on the roof of your mouth, he said it aligns your cranial bones. And so, if you think about it, people who grind their teeth, they grind because they aren't lined up correctly. They're trying to find that place. And and sure enough, the people that I treat, that's that's one of the first things that that stops because they're getting lined up. And you know, a lot of the martial arts things, I don't I don't know much about them, but I do know that a lot of them require their students to keep their tongue up on the roof of their mouth while they're working, practicing. Right, right. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so it was interesting, all these different um, symptoms that, that they uh, responded to, there were two symptoms. Now I had like probably, I don't know, 15, but two of those had to do with sleep apnea. And one of them was wake, wake up with the sensation of choking, and the other one was choke, gasp, or hold breath while sleeping. Okay, those are right. two sleep apnea um, symptoms. Well, those are the only two that went away 100% of the time. That's great. So why why do you it. think that uh, the from what I read and talked to people about, you know, apnea is caused and story too by the tongue, you know, falling back into the throat and obscuring the throat so the person can't breathe. But what's your understanding of uh, why the tongue exercises work? Is it just because okay. you're strengthening the tongue so that it doesn't fall back into the throat? Well, that's that's a huge part of it, yes. And that's a great question. Okay, so you lay down, you're tired, your tongue's tired. You, you go to sleep and all the muscles relax. Your tongue's made up of many muscles and they all get relaxed. And if your tongue is not used to living up on the roof of your mouth, then where is it? It's hanging around on the bottom. And as your head goes back on the pillow, your tongue starts to fall backwards some. And, you know, during the night sometime, it's just sometime, yeah, it just gets uh, lazier and lazier and, and may start creeping down to block your airway a little bit, maybe partially to begin with. And, and then as it goes down, it gets stuck in your airway. And that's when your, your air is cut off. And that's when that yeah. symptom of choking and gasping, you know, because that part right. of your brain that tells you to wake up works. Um, and so before I finish answering that, 
I have an aside. Um, I was introduced to a researcher at the University of Arizona, Dr. Ralph Fregosi, and he specializes in research of the tongue. And so he and I have been working together for years now. And um, he he explained to me why uh, what I've done with the tongue here, and that is the tongue has a natural uh, characteristic, a, a natural suctioning characteristic. And so when that tongue is traveling backwards and going down your your airway and getting stuck, what it's done is it has suctioned itself. And that's why it's so hard to for that tongue to be released without you waking up and making that happen. OK, so he pointed out that in my program, what I have done is I'm, I'm using that suctioning characteristic, but I'm using it for good. And so we're, we're directing the tongue up to the roof of the mouth so that it can literally suction itself and stay up there while you're sleeping. Oh, OK. So uh, the program is about seven weeks and you encourage people to do it twice a day for what, like five minutes each time or how long is it? Well, well, each exercise has a, a, a different instruction. So it might uh, uh, might teach you an exercise um, like um, you put your tongue up on the roof of your mouth and then just open and close your lower jaw and keep your tongue up there, suctioned up there while you're opening and closing your lower jaw. And you might do that in, in, until you've done it like 50 times. Okay, so that's not timed, but it's, you know, it doesn't take that long to do it. Um, or um, just there's an exercise where you, when I was growing up, it was a scolding sound. You put your tongue tip on the spot and it's like suctioning in and it's a, like that. And you do that for, you know, maybe uh, 15 seconds. It, it, so it, it's, they're all different. Okay, but, but none of them go too long. Um, the other thing, oh, what I wanted to tell you about um, the, the um, lessons, one of the big things, most important part of this uh, program is uh, how I make the tongue skinnier. And, right. um, yeah, and so um, I, there's a way, if, if, the, if certain muscles are stimulated in your tongue in a certain way, then um, it can actually change the way the tongue is is um, the size of the tongue, and um, and so I have been had been playing with ways to make that happen for for a while, and I couldn't find a utensil, if you will, that would allow me to make contact with the tongue and do what I thought needed to be done to make it skinnier, knowing you know what muscles are working and all that good stuff. So I um, I invented my own utensil, and I have a patent on it, and it's called the tongue stick because I couldn't think of a better name. Um, but yeah. yeah, it's called the tongue stick, and um, it is used to uh, stroke certain areas of your tongue. And while you're doing that, you also are um, simultaneously performing an isometric exercise. So one of those movements um, tones your tongue. You know, you can see a tongue, you stick it out, and it's all fat and flabby, you know. And But then you yeah. see another one that's toned. It's actually got a few little waves in it, maybe a, 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 a lower area down the middle of the tongue. Uh, anyway, so that's the tone. And, and the isometric exercise that we do strengthens the tongue. So um, this is a real important part of this program. I have um, before and after pictures of people's tongues. Um, oh, really? Uh, yeah, super wide. What do you and notice? Skinnier. So it, huh? how much skinnier does it get? How much skinnier does the tongue get? Well, let's see. Let's picture this. You open your mouth and you stick your tongue out, so it's just relaxed and it's coming down maybe halfway to your chin. And and if you look in the mirror, the sides of your tongue are probably as wide as your mouth is. Okay, it's filling up that whole mouth area horizontally can you picture that yeah. okay so after you make your tongue skinnier you can actually put your mouth in the same position but your tongue is not even meeting the sides of your mouth there's actually a little room on either side so mm -hmm. that whenever you put your tongue inside um, and 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 quite often those scallops those little um, indentations will disappear and people will say well i'm not biting my tongue anymore lots of different oh, wow. things happen yeah yeah so it's you should it's, you should uh you should tell people your tongue thinner is made of tungsten 
but it's not. I'm just kidding. It'd be funny. <laughs> well, I had I had a female one time take my tongue stick and rub it down the side of her body. Oh well. Okay. Really? Oh, try to. Ooh, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So that's cool. that didn't work. That didn't work though. So and my that's tongue right, stick is right. it's FDA approved and um, no. yeah. So it's 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 important. Very important. What is um, the indication that the FDA cleared it for? To literally to make your tongue tongue less wide. What was the FDA for? Yeah, you I'm said sorry. the FDA approved it. What did they specifically approve the tongue stick no, for? No, it is, no, it is FDA approved. The, 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 uh, what it's made out of is okay to put in your mouth. Oh, okay, okay. I thought it was a functionality. I got you. Makes sense. Yeah, okay. sorry. Oh. Yeah, I didn't want I'm anybody sorry. saying, oh, what's this going to do in my mouth? Yeah. What's a, what do you do for people that have um, you know stuffed up nose and they can't breathe oh. through their nose even if they want to? I'm so glad you said that. Well, there are some people who will not benefit from my program, and that's the huge group there, the ones that can't breathe through their nose. Now, a lot of us have seasonal allergies, and that's okay, um, but some people are congested all of the time or three-quarters of the time, and that's not okay. I mean, they can't breathe through their mouth when they sleep or they will die. So um, if, if I have someone come to me and they really want to do my program, the first thing they have to do is get their nose clear. You know, go to the uh, otolaryngologist or, you know, do whatever they need to do. Get get the deviated septum fixed, you know, whatever the problem is, um, do their best because nothing's going to improve until that does um, because they'll continue to mouth breathe all their life. Well, what if you um, do the tongue? Have, have you, well, here's a question. Have you had anyone that chronically stuffy nose, but they did the tongue exercises anyway? Yes. Did they experience anything happening to them? Uh, not very much. <laughs> Yes. So you, you've um, had matter, people that have tried it regardless? Well, okay, I've had one person because normally I don't accept them, okay? Um, now, the people that have bought my book online, I don't, I mean, I say let them know when, before they order it that if their nose is not clear, then they will not benefit from this program. But if they go ahead and buy it, that's their choice, okay? Right, um, right. But, but um, at one point, um, at, at Ralph Fergosi, the a researcher and I, we've been trying for years to get a gr grants through National Institute of Health, and we've never been able to get those grants. And the reason I'm saying this is, um, first of all, the the people who who looked at the grants, the reviewers just didn't understand this. This was just too easy, too good to be true, and you know it couldn't work. It's not like, surgery, right, so they don't like it. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And I, I I wonder about politics and that, too. But anyway, so at one point I decided I just really wanted to treat somebody. I wanted them to do research. I wanted them to have that overnight sleep study before they did my program and then have it again after my program. That's all the research that needed. OK, I mean, that tells yeah. you all. And so I found four adults and they were willing to have the sleep study before and after. And one of these adults, and this is where I'm going with the nasal congestion, one of these adults had nasal congestion most of the time, but she still wanted to be one of my participants. And I allowed her to because I felt great. I don't think she's going to get better, but this will help assure me that I'm on the right track with my thinking. Right. <laughs> you know, so, um, so I, I just want to share very quickly. Um, I, I can't share this anywhere else right now, but... <laughs> Um, so I had this one man who uh, stopped breathing 46 times an hour, and after yeah, what happens with apnea? Yeah, sleep apnea. That's that's severe sleep apnea. And after seven lessons of my program, he was uh, he stopped breathing 11 times an hour. Oh wow, that's dramatic. Isn't now, it? now he still has sleep apnea, okay? But right, it was right. only seven weeks post, and I think. That's that's something real important to look at too, you know. Uh, they talk about and and, and it's true uh, all the heart problems that people can have as a result of sleep apnea. Well, what if we could provide them with the treatment like this that happened that worked very quickly? You know that that can you know that can be you know what I bet uh, you know what I bet this would do. What um, since part of the problem of you know sleep apnea again is the choking and the CPAP or the oral appliance needs to mm -hmm. either advance the tongue or the CPAP needs to blow with a certain pressure. 
I bet mm-hmm. you that by you doing, you know, someone doing your exercises that they would require a lower pressure on their CPAP, which would make it more tolerable because the tongue is less yes. likely to fall back into the throat. So even right. if it doesn't cure apnea, it still will help people with CPAP compliance. It'll help people, again, reduce the effects mm-hmm. of apnea and all that. So it's got a lot of you're absolutely right. positive things mm-hmm. to it, you know? Yes, yes, you're right. Because uh, I know when I started this so long ago, I found that 4% of the people who had a CPAP machine, only 4% used it. That that's wow. that's horrible. I'm not sure that the percentage is a whole lot more today, but but and it's because they just couldn't uh, get used to that mask and and they wouldn't go back to have that that um, the air pressure regulated either. So uh, right. you right. know it was it was uh, fault faulted on both sides. But um, the two, if I may finish about these people, the two other two of the other people who uh, did the re- who did the overnight studies. One stopped breathing um, 17 times an hour at the beginning, and at the end, it went down to three, which is considered no sleep apnea. Below five is no sleep apnea. Okay. Right. And, and, right. And another one of them, um, she only stopped breathing six times an hour, but that's considered sleep apnea, and it went down to one. And then the yeah. one with the stuffy nose, she only stopped breathing 6.8 times per hour. I say only 6.8 times per hour. Now, her after um, her study after the treatment, it was six as opposed to 6.8. So there's just a hair difference. Okay. Um, okay. It, she, she still, you know, that was my example. But I, I found something very interesting working with someone who stopped snoring, uh, who stopped breathing 46 times versus six times. They they all had the same kinds of symptoms. It, it, the 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 um the severity of the symptoms seemed to be the same. I mean, uh, this uh, Johnny was just as tired as Mary, but they had a huge yeah. difference, you know, in the 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 number of times they stopped breathing. So I thought that was just very interesting. Um, that they were well, the over same. time, so, you know, I would again, I'm just theorizing here, but over time, the person that stopped breathing, you know six times an hour versus 46 times an hour. I would think the 46 one would experience all kinds of terrible medical problems. You know, it may take a few years, but I would think right. they would have more, far more problems to, than the yeah. other person. Yeah. Quicker. Yeah. You're, you're right. You're right. Um, absolutely. Um, so uh, what, when do you, when do you want to take this program? I mean, it seems like, I guess you don't have enough data, at least for the stuff he knows people. But I just wonder, it would be really cool if it did uh, improve the stuffy nose people somehow. I'm not sure, you know, but well, uh, I don't know if it's, it's an interesting okay, interest. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you when when it could. And, and okay, so the stuffiness that I'm going to be talking about is not uh, an allergic reaction. It's not a medical problem, okay? Some people have have breathed out, have only breathed out of their mouth for their entire life. And so if they were to close their lips and try to breathe through their nose, it would be stuffed up. And most of them would panic because there was no air and they would quickly open their lips and they would not want to try that again. I've worked with people like that. And I knew, of course, now I knew before I worked with them that there was no physical problem. It was just a, a, a psychological thing, a habit. It, okay. They were, habitual mouth breathers and so what what you have to do is you have to close your lips and you have to make yourself um keep your lips closed for five seconds and that might be all you can handle and then later on go up to 10 seconds it's a very it it can be a it can take quite a while it can take a few weeks to get it so that you're comfortable breathing through your nose so that's a time when when it it could be fixed you you know um Um, the other big thing, I can't believe I'm saying all this, but asthma, you know, asthma acts up in cold conditions, right? And, right. and I've worked with people who have uh, asthma and, you know, I, I'm saying when you breathe through your mouth, you're getting cold air in. Well, when they learn how to breathe through their nose, the air that they're taking in is no longer cold. And so what do you think happens with their asthma? Oh, it goes away. Well, it improves. <laughs> it improves. 
Yeah, yeah, it, it improves. It improves. Um, this is fantastic. You know, this is really great that oh, that good. people are experiencing all these uh, positive effects. You know? Oh yes, I, I just stay so excited about it. Um, and I actually have discovered something myself in the last week or two that that I'd like to share, if I may. It sure. is because um, we were talking about. Um, uh, the future of the industry, you know, what do we see happening right. with this? And um, I ran across this um, this research article online. It was uh, it was done by um, a Dr. Rick Wassing with the Netherlands Institute of Neuroscience, Netherlands Institute of Neuroscience, and they uh, they were looking at the link between sleep and mental disorders. And it caught my eye because of what we're, you know, all these mass shootings that we're going. Every, I think it's at the forefront of everyone's mind, you know, people with, with mental disorders. And, you know, maybe we need to really focus and be alert and try to help them, okay? Mm. And so um, uh, the article is fantastic. I'm just going to give you a conclusion here. Um, so what happens is you get, uh, let's say you get traumatized by something. And... Um, We've got these two uh, two things, excuse my medical terminology here, two things in our brain called uh, amygdala and these um, amygdala, sorry, amygdala. And these amygdala areas, they get activated when you are traumatized and um, or, you know, stimulated in a certain way. So they get activated, those areas do. And, and those are areas that will help control emotions and that kind of stuff. Okay, so that and they're supposed to do that, but then there's a time when the the um, trauma is supposed to subside. You know, you calm down, and uh, these amygdala are supposed to be able to shut down, rest, and reset, and you know, get ready for the next thing that happens in your life. Well, it turns out that they can only th- these areas can only uh, calm down and reset. If they get REM, if a person is able to get REM sleep. Mm. So if a person is not able to get REM sleep, that means that this trauma is still active and the next day something else happens and, it, and instead of replacing the former one, it's just building onto it. Okay. Right. And, um, so that's, uh, that's what this is all about. And, and so it was saying like for most people who suffer from PTSD, depression, anxiety, Bad sleep is part of their illness, and mm-hmm. and so far, um, everyone has tried to improve sleep by trying to improve the anxiety or the depression, but that has right. been very difficult to do. And so this article was all about what if we try to help the person learn how to sleep, will that help get rid of the anxiety and depression, which I got very excited about. Um mm-hmm. Uh, helping people sleep is much easier than solving their mental problems, you see. And if helping right. sleep, uh, of course, you know. So it, it's a promising yeah. way of improving illnesses that have stumped us for years. But um, I don't know how much hope is there for people to really believe that. But anyway, it's it's worth a shot at. <laughs> well, that's great. Uh, I had a yeah. quick question. You said you have a lot of before and after tongue pictures. What do the mm-hmm. tongues look like before and after? You know, let's say they didn't do any tongue thinning, but they just did the program. Like, what did you notice about people's tongues? How do they look different after, you know, working out of the gym for seven weeks? Well, well, like I was saying before, when they stick their tongue out, it's not as wide. And, and see, that's right. our goal. And so that's it, it looks different because it's not as wide and it, it hopefully doesn't have all those different crevices in it. You know, some tongues have a lot of crevices in it. And yeah. because it's too wide and um, and it, it's it fits better up on the roof of their mouth so that that tongue can get suction up there at nighttime. Is there anything else interesting you noticed about the tongues? Do they uh, I don't know anything else that jumps out of you or you thought that was strange, but, but interesting. Um, oh, gosh. Um, I don't know. I no. I think I, I think I've kind of covered all I know about that. Just. Um, Everybody's okay. tongue is different, but um, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, the only so here's the deal. 
I work with people all the time in my office. Um, but but if if a person's out there and and they want to try this on their own, they just go to the website. I just want to sleep dot com, and and whenever you Whenever you get this program, you can have access to it immediately, and it's kind of like a book. You open it up, and you see a table of contents, and you'll see lesson yeah. one, and then exercise one, two, three, and you can click on whichever exercise you want, but I mean, hopefully you do lesson one first, <laughs> you know, um, and you right. can go there, and, and you'll see the words describing it, and you'll see a video showing you how to do that exercise. So it really did turn out the way I wanted it to. And I also, uh, one more thing about children. The next, after I treated those 86 people, I decided to treat all children and 100% of the children stopped snoring. And it was marvelous. It was marvelous. One, one little girl said, I know I'm not snoring anymore. And I said, well, how do you know that? She said, because my cat's sleeping with me again. So (laughs) things like that, you know, this program, it's so easy to measure your success because of things like that happening. Uh, one woman said, my rooster doesn't wake me up anymore. Something, you know, d- just different ways that people have of measuring their success. It's, it's really fun, um, to watch all that happen. Uh, I had one uh, teenager who, um, his, his sheets would get real messy. Now your sheets get real messy because probably your legs are acting up, jumping around. And so as the program progresses, um, this guy said that his sheets were way over in the corner across from the bed. And, and each week oh, wow. those sheets got closer and closer and closer, meaning he wasn't, they, they weren't being kicked off as strongly as they used to until they ended up right, staying right. on the bed. I, I mean, you know, things like that. It, it just shows you. I, I never really had to ask people if they were doing their exercises. I could tell uh, because That's of the great. things that were happening. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but the children on the website, you can see 50 different comments by adults on the I Just Want to Sleep book. It, it it gives you ideas of of the kinds of things that that they um, experienced while doing the program. And um, I, I also wrote an I Just Want to Sleep for Kids book. And and you'll see that online also. And I've got some children's testimonials and embedded right. in the children's book. It's the same exercises, but there's a really lovely colored um, story, a story for the uh, parents to uh, cover or read to their kids. And it explains to them uh, what they're getting ready to do and why they're going to do it. It's 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 really um, it's really good. It, it helps them understand and appreciate doing it. So. Um, yeah, that's great. So that's all I know okay. right now. Well, very good. Um, what's the best way for folks? I guess you know, go to the website. I just want to sleep dot com. There, they can I pick up the program. They can do maybe sessions with you over Skype or something if they want. If they want to do something um, intense. Or... We we can do that if you like. There's no problem with that. And also, they'll have access to my cell number. That's how serious I am. Okay. So okay. people call me, great. ask me questions. If you get stuck on an exercise. I hope I can get you out of that. Okay. That's great. Well, Thank you know, thanks for all the work you do. And uh, I'm glad you came on the podcast. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious that we all have medical issues or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials, or even starting to appear on shelves, or by prescription, or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.